We are so lucky to have Nicolette Hahn Nyman here to address us. Um, she has a very interesting message that is very Northern Plains focused. I think um, we are all kindred spirits um, with her message, and I'm just really glad that she could make the trip to come over here. Um, and just a few words um, about um, our speaker. Nicolette Hahn Nyman is an attorney, a writer, livestock rancher, and mother. Much of her time is spent speaking and writing about the problems of industrialized livestock production, including the books, and her books include Defending Beef and The Righteous Pork Chop, Finding a Life, and Good Food Beyond Factory Farms. As a writer, she has also contributed to the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Atlantic Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and the Huffington Post. Previously, she was a senior she was a senior attorney for the environmental organization Waterkeeper Alliance, where she was in charge of the organization's campaign to reform the concentrated livestock and poultry industry, and before that, an attorney for the National Wildlife Federation. She served two terms on the city council for the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and she also received her Juris Doctorate from the University of Michigan in 1993 and her BA from Kalamazoo College in 1989. Currently, she lives in Northern California with her two sons and husband, Bill Nyman, founder of Nyman Ranch, a natural meat company supplied by a network of over 700 traditional farmers and ranchers. Together, Bill and Nicolette founded the meat company BN Ranch, which offers grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, and heritage turkey. So please put your hands together and welcome Nicolette Hahn Nyman. Move over there, I think. <laughs> First of all, just I really appreciate the invitation. It's a huge honor for me to come and speak to all of you, and especially this group, uh, because as the, in, the introduction suggested, I think there's a real kindred spirit uh, between what my work is all about and what you all are working on. Because I was talking to Steve. Um, on the telephone several months ago when he first contacted me, as well as yesterday on the way home, or on the way here from the airport. And he indicated that this organization was founded by ranchers who were um, working to protect uh, their land and worried about different kinds of threats, and especially from coal production. And what my focus in the last few years has been, especially is making the argument uh, to the world that ranchers, basically livestock tenders all over the world, are incredibly important uh, stewards of the land. And not only uh, is it a mistake to view ranching as inherently negative from an environmental perspective, which I think is increasingly an idea that's out there a lot, um, but it's also a huge uh, loss of opportunity because these people are um, tending livestock all over the world on the open grasslands and are an, actually an essential part of keeping those grasslands in existence and the grasslands are an essential part of the world's food system and ecosystems. So I'm going to talk about that today. That's the main um, point. I'm going to put a lot of specificity into this. And um, I am going to run through a lot of um, specific facts and, and data and stuff like that, not because I think you need to remember every single one of these uh, statistics, but rather because I want to illustrate um, that the data is there and that we don't need to accept a lot of the common myths and misstatements that are out there. We need to refute them. And I think the more each of us who believe the statements I just made about the value of ranching and, and livestock tending and livestock herders themselves, um, the more I think we, we all need to be armed with the ability to make that case. Because I think there is this growing assumption in the general public and, and in the environmental advocacy community that ranching is inherently a negative for the environment. So we have to figure out how to, how to um, refute that argument. 
So I'm gonna, um, <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, my husband and me, Bill, Bill Nyman and me, at, on our ranch in uh, Northern California. We're actually uh, in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. Those of you that are familiar with the Bay Area might know Point Reyes. We're just a little bit south of Point Reyes and we're actually occupying the very southern tip of the national park, the National Seashore Park, they're called the Point Reyes National Seashore. And most of the land that we graze is in that, is in that park. Um, Bill is really um, the reason I'm directly involved with livestock because I was working as an environmental lawyer for the Waterkeeper Alliance, as was mentioned, and that's an organization based in New York and headed by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He was my boss. And um, I was working mostly on fighting against livestock production, but it became very clear to me very quickly in that work that there was a huge difference uh, depending on how things were done as far as the implications for animals, humans, and the environment, not to mention the helpfulness of the food. So uh, I started working with the farmers and ranchers of the Nyman Ranch Network uh, very quickly in that, in that work that I was doing because we wanted to uh, illustrate in our campaign, in our advocacy work, and in our legal work that just because some, some livestock production was bad for the environment didn't mean all of it was, and that there was absolutely a necessity to uh, move towards more sustainable, more humane livestock production. And the Nyman Ranch Network was one group that was really focused on that. So we were using the Nyman Ranch farmers and ranchers, we were working together with them as a real world example of this. So I, it wasn't mentioned in my uh, introduction, but I was also, in addition to living in New York and being a lawyer and an environmental lawyer, <coughs> And a lifelong environmental activist, I was also a vegetarian. So it was <laughs> it was surprising to some people when I decided to marry Bill Nyman. But uh, the people who really know me uh, and people who know Bill did not find it surprising because, um, in truth, uh, you know, my own feeling has always been that uh, how you what you choose to eat is very personal choice, um, but that animals who are well raised um, are, provide uh, healthful food and provide all kinds of environmental benefits. I mean, I've learned more and more about that in the last 13 years. So we got married 13 years ago. I am still a vegetarian, so I'm one of the very few environmental ranchers uh, who's also a vegetarian. Uh, and, um, and it's a very small clique. I've met a couple other people. <laughs> I know a, a, a vegetarian butcher and, a, and another vegetarian ranch, <laughs> but we're a very small group. Okay, but I'm a huge advocate of, of well, well raised livestock, and uh, I'm going to tell you some more about why as I give this talk. Okay, so um, the first book I wrote in uh, 2009 was called Righteous Pork Shop Finding a Life in Good Food uh, Beyond Factory Farms. And the focus really was about sort of the problems associated with the more industrialized form of livestock production. But I also made the case in that book, as I was just saying, that well-raised livestock are a very important part of the food system and our ecosystems. But over the last, um, you know, since that book came out and, uh, and just over the last 13 years in general, as I've been living and working on a ranch every day, um, it's become increasingly clear to me that there was this sort of shorthand that was happening in the environmental community about beef especially. Livestock generally, but especially beef, that they were bad for the environment. And that basically the fewer cattle you had, the better. Uh, and I was kind of seeing something very different in on our ranch and on many of the excellent ranches that I visited around the country. And I, and I started realizing that someone who really understood the environmental arguments, but also understood the, the ranching side, needed to make this case. So needed, basically, Beef needed a good lawyer. And so I decided to get involved and be that person. And I decided I was going to write something that was really refuting these, what I believe are mostly myths, um, that are increasingly being accepted in the public health and environmental and basically just the general public uh, community. Okay. 
So here are some of the ideas that I think have been out there over the last few decades that have you know, kind of waxed and waned a little bit as far as which one is the focus. But these are most of the main ones that I've heard. And I kind of have them in chronological order. Um, I think overgrazing uh, has, is an idea that's been out there for a very, very long time. Every single one of these, by the way, has some element of truth to it, of course. Um, but by and large, I disagree with each of these statements. So I'm going to um, kind of just summarize what, I, what, these, what these statements are, and then I'm going to respond to them throughout the talk. So overgrazing was an idea that's been around for a very long time. And basically, uh, a lot of people believe that much of the American West has been destroyed by overgrazing. Now, they often just shorthand that as cattle. <laughs> so that goes back to that thing I was just saying a few minutes ago. You've got to make these important distinctions. Okay. But, so overgrazing has destroyed the American West. This is an idea that's been out there a long time, and it's still prevalent, um, although I think there's not as much focus on it these days as, it, as some of these other issues. Um, around you know mid 20th century, also we began to hear that uh, beef was very high in saturated fat, and therefore um, that was unhealthful. It causes heart disease and diabetes, and therefore we should avoid eating saturated fat and specifically beef. Um, beef is far too water intensive for our water stressed state and world. Now California, where I live, is in a historic drought right now. We're in the fifth year of a drought that is um, believed to be the greatest, the biggest drought you know, in the last 500 years. So um, th this is something where, you know, you hear a lot in California, and I just think the world in general is increasingly concerned about the lack of water. So this idea is really prevalent. Um, and then I think especially in the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of focus on this beef as a leading cause of climate change argument, although I keep uh, wondering how the elections are going to affect this because now we have a president that you know believes that climate change is a hoax caused by the chinese so um, you know, this is, all this stuff is maybe going to shift around a little bit as far as the public dialogue but um it's definitely uh, still you know very much the case that when people are talking about climate change people people who believe in human cause of climate change and they're trying to figure out what to do about it beef is often often you know talked about as something that people should be concerned about okay and then just in the last year, especially, um, the World Health Organization um, came out with something about beef and cancer. And, and so there's, again, kind of this shorthand argument, like beef causes cancer, therefore we shouldn't be eating it, so we shouldn't be raising cattle. OK. So these are kind of a lot of the, there are more, but this is, I think, the top, you know, the top five um, arguments against beef. And I'm going to respond to each of these, and I think it's good for everyone who believes in the value of uh, ranching and grazing, and especially cattle and beef, um, should be able to answer these, because these are things that people bring up a lot. OK, so it all starts by grass. It's really about the grass and understanding the importance of it and the value of it. Um, now, everybody in this room probably knows what I'm about to say already, but most Americans do not realize that Pretty much all cattle in the United States, especially beef cattle, spend a lot of their time on grass. You know, we all know that the mother cows are on grass, the calves are on grass, the bulls are on grass, and grass it really is the foundation of ranching in the United States, especially in the far west, but really throughout the, the whole country. And so, even when you're talking about beef that goes through a feedlot, grass is a, a really important component of that. And so. I, I argue that we really have to consider this grass issue as the basis of the whole reason why beef and cattle are so important. Um, so this, I like this, there's a wonderful speech that was given by Senator John James Ingalls in 1872 from Kansas. And it was called, and he called it the beneficence of grass. And he talked, and he was a great orator apparently, and talked in very soaring rhetoric about um, the animals of the field, and he used sort of biblical imagery of, of ashes to ashes and dust to dust, and how you have animals that grow and they're picking up on the basis of their grass, and they're eaten by other animals in the field, and then they return, their bodies return to the field and nourish the soils, and then more grass comes up. And he just talked about how every civilization rises and falls, but grass will cover those areas where the civilization once was. And just basically this protective covering of the earth with grass. Now, 
he didn't know a lot of the specific science that is now known about grass and the importance of grass ecosystems, but basically he had it exactly right. That's, that's kind of the foundation of it. Grass as this protective covering over the earth that provides um, a tremendous uh, opportunity for below ground healthfulness and as a foundation for the whole food system and, and ecosystems. So really, in super shorthand, which again, I'm going to get more detailed about this as I talk, but he, grass is basically protecting soils and water, the water, uh, both the water that is um, contained in the soil, as well as surface water and groundwater. It really builds the fertility of the soil wherever you have the grass covering. Where you have a, um, a multi-crop rotational type system, um, grass has been used for forever um, to control weeds and pests in those crop fields. And it provides, wherever you have grass, whether it's part of a rotational system or whether it's a permanent grassland, um, you have um, habitat for sort of countless uh, animals and uh, so, and uh, microorganisms. So when I talk about animals, I'm talking about everything from the tiny things up to the giant things, the megafauna all the way down to the microorganisms. And where you have grass, you have food and habitat for all of those animals, and just the birds and the bees being just two examples. And I just want to say, uh, in my book, Defending Beef, I actually talk uh, about half of it is about the environmental issues associated with grazing and grass. Um, production and beef production from grass. But um, about the other half is a lot of, about the food issue and the nutrition and the health issue. Um, and I'm not going to say that much about it because I think you all as an organization are mostly focused on the environmental side. But, um, but there's a lot more about it in my book and I just want to say something quickly about it. And basically it boils down to this. Um, there are extremely important nutrients that are provided by cattle and the other grazing animals. And they're uniquely nutritious. They're highly nutritious food. I think nowadays we have so much choice in our food, and you, know, you can just go to the grocery store and buy any, you know, one about thousands of items, literally. And so we tend to think that we don't need sort of these more traditional foods to, to nourish us. But when you really get down to what our bodies really truly need to be healthful, the things that beef offers are things that are actually essential and are um, this is in the highest possible quality form so for example and I've been a vegetarian for a really long time more than you know more than 25 years so I've done a huge amount of reading about nutrition over the years making sure I was getting enough nutrition and all this and I was shocked to learn how much um, how different it is the quality of the everything not just the protein. I've heard that um, you know beef and you know meat provides a higher quality protein than other sources, but I didn't realize how dramatic the difference was until I really researched it. This is true. Iron, um, for example, if you eat only plants, the type of iron, the non-heme iron contained in plants, compared to uh, the type of iron contained in, in animal sources, especially well, meat, especially the heme iron, um, you need more than twice as much iron of the non-heme type to equal that amount because your, your body has such a hard time absorbing the plant-based iron. This is also true for zinc. Exactly the same uh, uh, research has shown this very clearly that the zinc contained in beef is much higher quality than the zinc contained in a plant source. And B12, of course, is uniquely in animal foods, not in plants at all. So um, you, especially for vegans, these, these are B12 especially is a real challenge. Um, so I think sometimes this, this issue gets a little bit underplayed. We tend to think in um, sort of modern developed societies, we don't really need um, to worry too much about nutrition or kind of getting everything we need. But in fact, there's a lot of research showing that Americans are not getting enough, a lot of this. Just again, to sort of use iron as an example, um, there, there is some very credible research showing that about 30% of women who are pregnant are significantly um, iron deficient. And there may be really long-term consequences of that. So um, there was a study that came out just a couple of years ago showing that the, um, the lower the woman's iron blood level during her pregnancy, the higher the risk of autism in the, in the offspring. Now, 
this is very new research. It might not turn out to be correct. It might just be a correlation. But that's, this was a very credible research, uh, university-based study um, showing this. And it might be leading to some clues about some, you know, the sort of rise in autism rates. And um, I just want to you know, just make that point that um, we should not overlook the nutritional importance of this food. Um, and that we should not accept the idea that we don't need this food anymore. I think we do. Um, now, just to address one of the points I had up there as far as the critiques of these, this cancer point that, um, that, I, that I mentioned last. Last year, the World Health Organization came out with a, a, a new categorization for beef, um, taking it, um, but putting it into the same category as cigarettes. <laughs> now, a lot of people who raise beef were, you know, understandably up in arms about this. And I was actually contacted. I was on, I was on a couple of radio talk shows, and I was interviewed by the media quite a bit about this. And so I spent a lot of time looking at their report and I'm trying to understand it. And it became clear to me that, you know, this is another example of this sort of clickbait, modern misinformation age we're living in now. Um, it was way overblown. I mean, I think the World Health Organization made kind of an error in the way they presented it to the public, and they actually sort of somewhat retracted what they had stated about it just a few weeks later because they realized they had caused this fire storm that really should, they should have done that. Um, and they, they sort of tried to moderate the language of it a lot um, in their subsequent press releases. Um, but what, they, what, what it really says, sort of the bottom line of what the World Health Organization um, did was, um, they simply looked at all of the studies that are out there and they categorized, uh, recategorized red meat and processed meats and said that there are certain things where there's evidence of some, uh, there's some evidence of uh, carcinogenic, carcinogenicity. <laughs> I don't want to try to say that word again. <laughs> that it is a carcinogen. Carcinogen. <laughs> I guess I'm going to avoid that word altogether. Okay. Um, it causes cancer. Um, and and then there is there are certain substances that they believe you can actually say, yes, there is some connection to some that you say, well, there might be, whatever. And really, all of these studies are simply based on correlation. Now, correlation is is the weakest form. You know, as a lawyer, I can tell you correlation is actually the, the weakest form of evidence. Um, but it doesn't mean it's you know worthless. Um, so smoking, you know, the evidence for smoking and cancer is actually very strong, and that's also just a correlation. So it's not that that means you should toss it out, but it certainly lowers the weight of it. Um, and really, when you looked at what the, the World Health Organization was really looking at, it was really um, about processed meats more than anything else. Um, there is some evidence that I agree is credible. Um, suggesting that eating a lot of processed meats can raise your cancer risk. Now, even in that situation, however, and the reason um, this often gets lumped in with just beef, uh, beef or pork or red meats in general, because a lot of the processed meats um, are from red meats. So a lot of times, the vast, vast, vast majority of the studies don't make any distinction, and then they come out with, you know, showing a showing of increased cancer rates or increased other rates, heart disease, whatever. And there was actually a really big study that I talked about in New Delhi Beef, where based on Harvard at Harvard University, where they um, where they actually um, took out all the studies that um, made the distinction between fresh meats and processed meats, and they found that once you did that, there was no increased um, risk for heart disease at all when you pulled it to pull these things apart. So there's probably something in processed meats, whether it's some whether it's the process something being done in the process, or whether it's the nitrates or whatever it is, there probably is some correlation with increased health issues with processed meats. So for myself, for example, and in our household, um, I make sure our processed meat consumption is not super high. I mean, I would say certainly not every day. If you're eating bacon every morning, I would recommend you scale back a little bit. Okay. Um, but, look, but what does the number? What does the number actually mean? Okay, so 18 percent in the in the in the World Health Organization um, release, they talked about there being an 18 percent increase in colon cancer risk specifically. That was the only um, cancer that they actually showed an increased risk. But what it really was was it was a lifelong uh, risk for colon cancer that went from 5 percent to 5.85 percent. So it's a really um, important to understand what the language actually means. It's a tiny, tiny, infant, you know, extremely small increase in risk in one specific type of cancer from uh, very regular consumption of processed meats 
specifically. By contrast, smoking increases your risk for cancer, for lung cancer, by 2,000%. Okay, so just putting this, you know, you've got to just take all this stuff in context. And then there's the healthy user bias. There's a whole bunch of writing and, and analysis by really smart people that have shown that people that eat a lot of processed meats also tend to be people who don't live in an otherwise healthy way. They don't exercise as much, they eat more sugar, uh, they're much more sedentary, and blah, blah, blah. And so it's very hard to control for that. So I still think all of this, we have to view with a somewhat skeptical eye. Um, and for me, it was really important that there's absolutely no, none of the studies make any differentiation about how the animals were raised. So are these, um, are people eating really good meat that they got from, you know, a local farmer that they raised themselves and they know doesn't have any, you know, hormones in it, for example, or, you know, added other forms of additives in the feed. There's no research at all on that point. So in my view, again, well-raised animals, healthy food is a helpful food. And I don't think we need to get too um, caught up in this stuff. The reason I'm going into so much detail on this is because this is something a lot of people are talking about and a lot of people believe. So just to make sure all of you can um, respond to this um, if this ever comes up. Okay. Now, stepping back again into the environmental side of this. Um, grass and soil are the whole keys to this issue. Why are the grazing animals so important? Because they create and they maintain and they protect this grass cover on this huge portion of the earth. It's estimated that between 40 to 70 percent of the earth is covered by grass. And the reason that the variation is so huge between 40 to 70 percent, it sort of depends on how you count the acreage. <clears throat> but it's a large portion of the earth. And what's beneath the grass is even sort of more important. Um, if, when you look at a grass plant, um, and of course they're very, you know, we all know there are lots of different types of grasses, and so this varies a lot, um, but on average, about 90% of the grass plant is actually below ground. And that is part of what's so valuable about grass. It has this incredible below ground um, existence that is doing all kinds of important things down there. And basically, it's kind of summarized in these points. It creates optimal subterranean environments for the microorganisms, both in terms of number and diversity. So there are lots more in terms of number of these microorganisms in, in uh, well-managed grasslands. And the, and the microorganisms are more diverse. And just like in a big ecosystem, you know, when you look at the picture of an African safari or something and you see all different kinds of animals, the diversity is incredibly important. It, it's kind of the key to the helpfulness of the system, how diverse is it. That is also true at the microorganism level. And actually there was a great study, I think it was about a year and a half ago, that was done by a Chinese um, university and a European research um, team combined. And they talked about this incredible importance of soil microorganism diversity as the foundation for ecosystem health. So if we're not thinking about this, we're just ignoring, you know, what Dr. David Montgomery would call the hidden half of nature. Because that hidden half of nature, those subterranean microorganisms are really at the foundation of healthful ecosystems. In, in a good grassland, you also have um, the existence of grass, and especially when it's being grazed, you have um, a lot of activity that's happening that is increasing the nutrient, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fertility of that soil. And um, specifically in grasslands, it's been shown that that's the highest, uh, and especially uh, native grasslands, that's the highest level of glomalin or glomalin, depending on how you want to pronounce that, which I'll talk more about in, in a moment, but that's believed to be the key to carbon sequestration in the soil and to the existence of soil, carbon in soil, excuse me. Now, um, water, I know you all are especially focused on water, um, and water quantity is one of the, again, reasons why the grass, uh, the, the existence of grass is so important and the understanding of what it offers is so important. And so many people just assume when you're talking about beef, you're talking about a net negative effect on water quantity. But I think it's actually just the opposite. Okay, first of all, the amount of water that is actually used to produce a pound of beef is dramatically misunderstood by about 99% of the people that are talking about this. 
Um, the all pretty much all of the people that are you know the media takes their figures from one or two particular <coughs> sources. There's actually a really good organization in Norway that does water footprint analyses. And they break this all down very clearly, and they say what types of water go into what, you know, when you create a water footprint or something. But going back as far as uh, the mid-1990s, the University of California researchers at Davis, um, the Davis part of the University of California system, um, felt it was really important to actually look at this water footprint number because there was so much discussion in California about the drought and the impact of, of cattle on this. And so what they did was they broke down the amount of water that goes into each stage of the life cycle of beef cattle and to create a pound of beef. And they found that the typical pound of beef, not just, not just, not sort of the very best raised <laughs> beef, but just the typical American supermarket pound of beef on average is about 440 gallons of water per pound of beef. Now, that might sound high, but when you compare that to uh, you know, 3,500 gallons per, you know, per pound and other kinds of numbers that are frequently cited. 12,000 gallons, is, there's all kinds of numbers that are out there that are kind of crazy. And why, why is there this enormous discrepancy? This is the point that it's important to understand. It's all about the type of water that goes into the system. So almost all of that 12,000 gallons or, you know, 3,500 gallons figure comes from the green water. And the green water is actually the water that's contained in the grass that the animals are grazing. So that's a pretty create that's a pretty crazy number <laughs> to use, and that's basically what UC uh, Davis researchers said. They said that should not be counted when you're actually considering this. And there are lots of reasons why you shouldn't consider that. But the main reason, you know, to me, the most compelling reason not to do that is because the water that's contained in the grass and that the animals then grazing and mostly returning to the ecosystem is, that's beneficial to the whole ecosystem to have that water in there. So why would you count that against a food, okay? You really want to look at the blue water especially, so that's kind of the water that is drunk by the animals, that's clean enough um, to actually be used for some other purpose. And uh, also, if there, are, you know, if there are surface waters, if, if things are being irrigated, that should be counted. Um, there are lots of different you know, legitimate uh, inputs of water that should be counted, but I think the water that's actually contained in the vegetation that they're consuming should not be counted. And if you take that out, the calculation just completely changes. The 440 gallons, if you accept that figure, which I do, um, is about the same as a pound of rice. So it's important to keep that in mind. It is not some way out crazy figure per pound of beef as a lot of people tend to think. There are lots of intensive water, that's still relatively water intensive, but it's not too far off from lots of other foods that we all consume, like coffee, sugar, avocados, walnuts, almonds, um, chocolate. Now who wants to give up their chocolate, right? So it's, it's, you know, we, we need to consider a lot of issues when we're thinking about sustainable food systems. But I think this water thing is just grossly misunderstood by most people talking about it. When you look at specifically grass-fed beef, uh, the water consumption goes down quite a bit further even. And I haven't seen a really credible figure on this, but the figure that I cite in my books are the last one that uh, I've seen is about 120 gallons of water per pound of beef. So it's even significantly lower than a standard um, grocery store variety pound of beef. Now, most importantly, though, is this actually is the third point. And that is that when you look at sort of water quantity as a big picture issue and try to figure out what should we be doing as a world and as a state and as a community about water, there's very good evidence that water contained in the soils, in the ecosystems, is dramatically increased uh, by good grazing practices. So my Defending Beef book is actually a critique of a lot of what's happening in the beef industry today as well as a defense of beef because one thing that I think lots of people in the world um, should be more focused on is how do we create optimal grazing and one of the things that's been shown is when you have really good grazing practices there's actually a great deal more water retained in that ecosystem and that benefits everyone. So it, my argument is that from a water quantity perspective 
beef have the potential to be a net positive. It's not all being done that way today, but what that means is we need to focus on improving grazing practices, not on getting rid of cattle. Similarly, water quality research shows that the, and this is, you know, when I was an environmental lawyer working for Wild National Wildlife Federation and Water Keeper Alliance, this was my focus, the water quantity and quality, especially quality issues. Um, you know, how much pollution is coming off of these operations? Basically, that's what water quality is all about. And there's really good research on this showing that where you have, again, especially good grazing, well-managed grazing in particular, really has a great deal less sediment than other land use sources, especially crop production, and far less nutrient runoff. And these are both just figures that were from some studies done by the um, Land Stewardship Project in, in Minnesota, but, but these are you know, fairly consistent with other research that's been done. That is the, it goes back to that protective covering provided by the grass, once again, and, and those roots that are below ground, it really hangs onto um, the sediment. It holds the water in. That's why the water holding capacity is so much higher when you have a good, a healthy grass ecosystem. And you also have much, much less nutrient runoff where you have all of the, that sort of tangled network of below ground roots and in this field, but also the above ground protective um, blanket of vegetation. Um, too. Okay, and this is um, just a, a little bit of a photograph. This doesn't show the roots go much further down, but I just want to just sort of illustrate a little bit of what's happening down there. It's both um, the existence of all these little tiny uh, uh, roots that create this below ground environment. It creates little pockets for water to go into, and it also creates a surface area where all of this stuff is happening in conjunction with. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi that are covering um, the roots. You have this, this is actually a photograph taken by USDA researchers of the glow melon I was talking about before, which is actually a sort of coating, a, a honey-like substance that coats the roots and in conjunction with these fungi actually creates all of these exchanges that are taking place below ground. The exchanges from the sun, the carbon comes into the plant, Carbon dioxide is um, taken into the plant, it's carbon. It is brought into the plant and the carbon is exchanged with, via the microorganisms and the glomalin for the nutrients that the plant needs. It's an amazing system. There's a lot of research going on about this right now. And it all goes back to this idea of having this vegetative cover year round. The more, the longer it's there, the better. And, the, and every time it's plowed, uh, this is a totally destructive. So, Permanent grassland is the best. Um, this is a, this is a sort of another study showing that um, sort of from an environmental uh, perspective and specifically looking at uh, wildlife. This shows that um, this was just a migrate, migrating bird study showing that where you had migrating birds, they really didn't um, have any habitat in cropland, but they had lots of habitat in grasslands, and it's just showing that that's one of the benefits of having grassland. This is an article that I wrote for The Atlantic where I was describing some research done at UC Berkeley by, a, by the biology department there, um, quantifying the role of bees in the food system. And it actually shows that wild pollinators, in particular right now because of colony collapse disorder, which is kind of wiping out the domesticated bees, um, these wild pollinators are incredibly important. And there are lots of different kinds of wild pollinators, but the vast majority of pollination done by wild animals is done by wild bees. And the main habitat for these bees is actually grazed areas, um, branches. And so in addition to the fact that you're creating all the habitat and all the protection of soil and water and everything else in the grazed area, you're actually providing enormous benefits to crop production that's nearby. And that's something that is almost never talked about. Okay, now looking more specifically at climate change for a second, um, I just want to quickly run through some of the figures that have been thrown out there. Um, there's the 18% figure we've all heard from, from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in 2006. It said all livestock globally cause about 18% of global warming gases. There was a really wild and crazy figure, which I could refute for several days in a row. I mean, it's just a ridiculous figure. 51% that sometimes gets cited, no credibility to that at all. 14% um, became the figure that the Food and Agriculture Organization lowered their number to a few years later, so that's actually a much more current figure. And, the, and there's a Chatham House report coming out of England that's also based on that 14% figure. 
And there's a popular movie that's been going around on college campuses, especially, especially called Cowspiracy, that um, cites this figure as its basis um, and says that more than half of global warming gases are caused by cattle, especially. Um, that's wildly inaccurate. Um, I just want to quickly refute it. I want to make sure we have time for questions, so I'm not going to go too much longer, but I want to say a few specific things about the, gar the carbon um, methane and nitrous oxide. So, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, which I would commend to any of you that are interested in this. There are two. There are actually two op-eds I would really recommend that you um, look for online that I've read. One was um, The Carnivore's Dilemma that I wrote in 2009 for the New York Times, specifically about um, climate change and why this issue has been really oversimplified when it comes to livestock production. And the other is an op-ed I wrote for the Wall Street Journal, um, which is called Actually Raising Beef is Good for the Planet. <laughs> and that was from last year. Um, and in those, I basically just summarized you know, some of the points I'm making here today. Um, I also noted that if you sort of break down the, the greenhouse gases and look at them more specifically, it becomes clear how, un how oversimplified this issue has become. So in the United States, all of agriculture is estimated by the EPA, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to cause about 8 to 10 percent of greenhouse gases. So that just tells you right now, when you're talking about the U.S., almost all those figures that I just read to you are not even close to being relevant. Um, when you look at carbon dioxide, or carbon as it's usually called um, in these conversations, it, it's about the transportation, the automation, the harvesting, etc. And beef production is a very minor contributor to that. So it, carbon is not really much of an issue with respect to beef. Nitrous oxide is all about fertilized crops production. So um, while it's an important greenhouse gas, to the extent that you're uh, reducing the use of fertilizers, or especially if you're not using crop inputs at all, so in other words, totally grass-based beef production, it is really, it's really not an issue. So that there's a way to avoid that in beef production as well. Methane is really the key concern with respect to cattle. And the methane comes from both from the manure and from the enteric fermentation, the digestive processes. And a few points I want to make that everybody, make sure everybody's familiar with about this when you're talking to people about this. One is that when you look at um, uh, Pennsylvania State University, so credible, you know, very credible um, university, has come out with an estimate of how much uh, ruminant emissions there were before humans got to the new world. And it's actually estimated that the pre-settlement ruminant emissions were higher than the current um, emissions from the domesticated animals. So when we think about what, you know, what emission sources are new and created by humans that really need to be addressed, I would argue this suggests that this is not as important as some other forms of emission. The, another point is that when you look at the, um, the, the, the question of methane emissions, you have to consider the whole life cycle of those emissions and their, and their, their fate. And that's rarely done. So it really needs to be looked at from an ecosystem's perspective. And that goes back to the healthful soil bacteria again. There's very good evidence now that when you do well-managed grazing, you have much higher levels of all the biological activity, including the existence of these methanotropes, or methane oxidizing bacteria, MOB. And there's been research done by Jones in Australia, Singh in India, and Adams also in Australia, all on this issue. There's lots of research going on about this. But some of it even shows that in a well-managed ecosystem, um, that the cattle can be totally methane neutral because of the existence of really healthful populations of the methane oxidizing bacteria. So there may be a possibility for a lot of offset of the methane, or maybe even a total offset of the methane, in a well-managed grazing system. And finally, there's a lot of attention being paid right now all over the world to the uh, the mitigation, the ways to mitigate. And, um, and one of the things that's been shown is if you have well-managed grazing, again, um, you, through, for various different reasons, the quality of the feed is better, that equals lower methane emissions, etc. I was just watching a video this morning about dung beetles and how basically higher populations of dung beetles mean far lower emissions. About, uh, it's, it's been shown that about 20 there's about a 20% reduction in methane emissions from the manure where you have a good population of dung beetles. So all these pieces added together, I think, are going to lead to pretty significant um, methane reductions when people start focusing on them. 
The rice industry was actually the world's leading cause of methane caused by humans in the 1980s. And the rice industry began to really focus on this and what do we do about this and change some of the practices and have dramatically lowered their methane emissions. The same thing is happening right now in the beef industry. And I would sort of urge everyone in this room who's involved in beef production to educate yourself on what you can do. For example, what about the dung beetles on your own ranch? Um, there's some evidence that the use of um, some of the, uh, the medications that are put, or medications is not the right word, but the drugs that are used to prevent liver flukes, for example, um, are, are problematic for dung beetles. So some of these issues, I think, are complex. We have to think about what do we do about this? Um, how do we make sure that our dung beetles are happy on our ranches? Okay. Um, <laughs> bottom line on climate. Um, is that the current system, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for more, uh, for better practices, there's a lot of opportunity for various forms of mitigation, as I was just mentioning some of those. But globally, right now, cattle are probably, um, if you just, just accepting the current research, um, about 9% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. But in the US, that figure is about 2%. And then, again, that's the official figure that, from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And, both of those figures, I believe, can be dramatically reduced. Uh, even the Food and Agriculture Organization report states grassland car carbon sequestration can significantly offset emissions. That's something that I think is well, well accepted. And there's tremendous other potential for mitigation, some of it I just mentioned. Overall, I think we just need to look at this picture from a much um, longer term perspective. Uh, if you look at the Earth's history, about 66 million years ago, the dinosaurs disappeared, and a little bit after that, grasses started appearing all over the place. By 40 million years ago, there were major grassland ecosystems all over the Earth, and huge herds of herbivores, especially ruminants, were maintaining those grasslands. And it was only in the last 100,000 years, that sounds like a long amount of time, but when you look at the Earth's longer term history, it's not that long, the large mammals really started to disappear from overkilling by humans and also from changes in the climate. So really, this was actually the norm for most of the recent history, for tens of millions of years, the Earth was covered by these huge herds. This is a remnant of what was once covering the Earth. This is the, um, the caribou in the Arctic. This, this still exists, but it's just a tiny piece of what was once there. And this is the Cape Buffalo on the Serengeti, so again, a tiny remnant of the huge herds that once covered the earth. And there's a picture of the bison, which of course, again, a tiny portion of what, what we once had. But it's very important not to allow the argument to be accepted that we should have as few grazing animals as possible and we want you know, lower, tiny little herds with just you know, very you know, sparsely populated. I think that's actually the totally wrong way to go. The animal impact is not only uh, important, I believe it's essential for ecosystem function. And this is a picture of um, artist rendition of what you know the prehistoric North America might have looked like, where you had large herds of these huge herbivores and huge packs of predators. And this animal impact was enormous. And I just think we absolutely need to understand that this is how the Earth evolved. And if we don't have these animals, the Earth cannot function properly. So a couple of pictures of prehistoric animals that basically look exactly like cattle that were in the North America. This is the shrub ox, and this is the little musk ox. So when people say, well, sure, but we didn't have cattle, that's an import. I don't buy that. OK, just a couple of quick pictures of our ranch. This is, a, this is a, the entrance of our ranch. Again, we're in Marin County, Northern California. And this is my husband. Um, with, the reason I show this picture is because we have a, uh, we're in the Mediterranean type climate, so we have a wet season and a dry season, we have a green season and a brown season. <coughs> so it looks like <coughs> this during the green season, it looks like this <coughs> during the brown season, and we do supplement with some hay. Otherwise, we're totally grass-based. <coughs> and there's me, so just to prove I actually do do some work with the cattle. <laughs> and these are our heritage turkeys. We also, if they're outside during the day, they go in a barn at night. And this is my favorite cow. And I uh, thank you for your attention, and I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions, so I'm going to stop there. Okay.
I know your, your husband's been quite involved in marketing, alternative marketing. Okay, I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> So I know, you know, Bill's been involved for many years in, in marketing beef in uh, niche markets, alternative ways, and assuming your argument eventually is understood by the majority of people, what role do you think just the economics of being able to deliver beef economically for the average family ranch and farmer? Uh, I know Bill and yourself have been trying to develop different things. There's a lot of people, but uh, assuming we're providing all these useful services, uh, is there some other return we can get from strictly just selling the beef itself? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are a couple of important questions about the economics. One is, um, how is it, how do we make this kind of meat basically affordable for people who are trying to buy it? And then how do we make sure that the living that uh, ranchers are, are, are having from raising cattle is a sustainable living. Um, so uh, there's a lot, you know, one of the things, um, one of the things I think is important to understand about the current system, and I'm sure many, many of you are very aware of this already, but is we're really not operating in a free market system right now. So there's a, a huge amount that's done um, that is basically subsidizing the production of cheap, food in general and specifically cheap meat. Um, and you know the grain subsidy is a good example of that because actually um, it's not it has it depends on grain you know prices in the market, but for much of the last 20 years there's been a pretty substantial subsidy to the grain. And the creation of cheap grain creates the possibility of creation of cheap um, cheap meat. Um, you know I think um, overall I think that we have to have a system where the rancher, the farmer, is able to, to do the right practices um, and make a living at it. Um, so the reason what, what Bill has been trying to do, the reason, the reason he created the Nine Ranch Network and our current uh, BM Ranch, is what we're trying to do is create something where people can be full-time farmers and ranchers and then their product can get to market. So we're really kind of aggregating things. We're rather than, um, you know, we don't take our meat directly to a farmer's market or a CSA and give it to people directly. We get like-minded people together and then we provide it to retailers and uh, restaurants. So I think one of the answers um, actually is that kind of a model. Um, people coming together to create, um, getting common standards. Um, whether animal husbandry, um, land stewardship, et cetera, and coming together and having labels, you know, whether it's or you know, country natural, country natural, or whether it's mine ranch or whatever, um, coming up with systems like that that provides a better price to the rancher, um, but is also um, providing the customer the awareness of what they're getting. I think more and more people are seeking that. Um, in defending beef, I talked a little bit about the percentage of um, the dollar that Americans spend on, um, you know, on food. And we used to spend about 30% of our income on food in the United States, and now we spend about 9%. <coughs> so I think part of what is beginning to happen is people are shifting. Uh, some of the awareness is shifting, and people are feeling like they're, they're willing to pay more for good quality food if they know that's what it is. I think when people pay more for food, that helps. Um, that helps the farmer and rancher. I think when people, when farmers and ranchers come together um, and create common marketing systems, um, that's another thing that can help economically. I think um, public policy should support sustainable practices. I don't think we should be supporting um, the kind of farming that is causing environmental devastation. Uh, I've written about this a number of different times. Um, so I'm not sure if I really answered the question you asked, but there, there are challenging um, you know, economic issues here, uh, and I don't think there's any one answer. But I do think the rising awareness among consumers is a really important part of the answer. And I think public policy, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see what a Trump administration is going to look like, because um, while I personally am <laughs> not very optimistic, um, you know, there could be some good things coming from it, and one of the things might be um, 
if it if it's easier, you know, for people in the marketplace to get their product to market. Um, and so we might that might end up helping uh, the the smaller scale uh, farmer and rancher. I'm not sure about that yet, but that there's a possibility of that. So um, those are a few thoughts. Uh, thank you. Um, you uh, pointed out the, the importance of, of grass and the soil, and I'm wondering if any studies have been done on the correlation, and this is not far fetched, I don't believe, on chemical farming on greenlands and its effect on beef and cattle and, and other animals. For example, uh, it was a long time practice, uh, maybe a little farther south in the northern tier, but uh, grazing uh, winter wheat as it sprouted and, and what's happening now. I notice here in Montana in the wheat belt, uh, the, the fences are beginning to go and that grazing in the fall of the wheat, uh, there are no cattle there anymore. So economically, uh -huh. health-wise, environmentally, um, I'm concerned. Well, you know, it's funny, it, when it comes to the public health and, um, you know, sort of nutrition and health, public health studies, um, they're really sorely lacking in terms of looking at the history of the food. I mean, it's, studies are, it's really hard to study this, actually. I have some sympathy for the researchers who try to, um, you know, figure out what foods cause what chronic diseases and so forth. Because if you, if I ask any of you what you ate yesterday, <laughs> You would probably have a hard time um, explaining it with any specificity, but try to imagine filling out surveys that, that explain what you ate for the last year. Okay, that's actually what these studies are based on. So there's very little um, accuracy to the research overall, but there's also no attempt at all right now to even you know try to figure out what happened on the farm. So there's this gaping hole in terms of the research and the understanding. I mean, my own feeling is that we are going to have to move away. I mean, even if you just think about it from a fossil fuels perspective, um, we know that the fossil fuels, um, you know, it's a finite resource. Um, we may be more than halfway through using the fossil fuels that are available. And all of the agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, all of them are basically very fossil fuel intensive. They're based on fossil fuels. And so we know that even just from the perspective of the volatility of the cost of the fossil fuels, not even the eventual running out of it concern, but the volatility, which was really you know, illustrated in 2008 when there was a huge upswing in the prices of fossil fuels, we know that farming food production cannot be so heavily dependent on fossil fuel production. It is right now, but it really has to move away from that. Um, so there isn't very good research about the, you know, the long-term health impacts of, um, you know, any food with chemicals, for, you know, used in the production. Um, but my own feeling is that there's a really good reason to be skeptical of that food. And from an ecological perspective, it's definitely clear that that long-term health of, for example, the soils. I didn't talk about it, but even the uh, use of fertilizers has been shown to reduce the presence of the glomalin in the soils. So it's kind of far, the, the long-term negative impacts of chemicals on the soils are far greater than we once realized. And if you look at it from the perspective, one book I just want to encourage everybody to read, if you haven't already, is, and I have a lot of recommendations I can make, but I'm going to put this one at the very top, and that is David Montgomery's book, The Hidden Half of Nature. David, his, his wife, Anna, and he co-wrote it. And he wrote the book, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, which is a fabulous book, but the one I would really recommend you put first on your list is The Hidden Half of Nature. And it's all about this question of the microbes. And about half of the book talks about the microbes in our body and how they're this enormous portion of our body, and they do everything from immune system function to, you know, not just the health of your gut, you know, like whether you're having a problem with your gut, but the whole body might be dependent on the health of your microorganisms in your gut. There's more and more indication that that's the case. And the soils, and he kind of connects these two issues, but he spends the other half of the book talking about the microorganisms in the soils and how we basically ignore them, but they're actually the foundation, as I said several times during my talk, of healthful ecosystems. 
So this book, um, The Hidden Half of Nature, that hidden half is being those unseen microbes, um, really makes this case, and I think it's a really important thing for everybody involved in concern about land stewardship and human health, and especially grazing. Uh, think about that. He's actually, David Montgomery just sent, I, I've met him a couple times, and I know him um, through email and stuff, too, and he just sent me his brand new book, uh, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I have it with me in the hotel room, <laughs> um, which is about, basically, um, part of it is about the role of the grazing animals and being beneficial. So he's really bought into this argument. What he told me personally, um, when I was talking to him a few months ago, one-on-one, -on -one, he said, 10 years ago, I never would have bought this argument that you need the grazing animals for healthful soils. And he said, now I totally believe it. I've seen it for myself. So we have time for a very short last question. <laughs> one, one more last short question. question. And then we'll have a okay, thank you very much for um, really insightful destruction of some of the myths of the, the uh, terrible damage that cattle raising is doing. Uh, but Nicolette, would you summarize briefly the best practices, best good grazing practices? I mean, I, I got the point about the dung beetles, we got to keep them alive and well, and uh, grazing, of course, and grass fit. But are there other things that you would point to as, as really best practices in yes. grazing? Yes, well, thank you for that question, because I think especially with this audience, that's probably a good thing to mention. I do not, in my book, uh, try to um, lay those out with any specificity, partly because, number one, I don't have enough expertise to do that, but number two, um, I, everything I've seen and learned over the last 16 years um, has taught me that it's incredibly site specific. So I really believe that every different branch has a different answer to that question. I think it has to be, uh, there has to be very careful thought about how any given piece of land is grazed or even not grazed. Maybe in some places um, the best solution is not to graze. Uh, but I really find uh, the work of the Savory Institute, incredibly compelling. Um, Alan Savory, uh, the uh, African um, wildlife biologist who began as an absolute uh, opponent of cattle and grazing and is now the world's most visible champion of cattle and grazing because he has um, seen in his you know, five decades of work on this that where you have a lot of grazing, uh, whether it's by wild or well-managed domesticated animals, um, you have life, you have water, you have healthful soils. And where you take those things away, you have death. You have an absence of that recycling of life that leads to all life. So the Savory Institute, which is based in, um, actually in Boulder, Colorado, uh, but works all over the world, uh, has extremely helpful resources and, and Alan Savory's book, if any of you don't have it, I would certainly recommend it. Um, he gives you know, some ideas, but it's really site specific. His approach is holistic management, he calls it, and it's all about trying to consider all the factors on any given place and in any given community and coming up with a plan. And he makes the argument that the grazing is really important, the animal impact is really important, but the resting is at least as important. So it's all about planning the impact and the resting. Um, so the, I don't think there's any one answer. I, I would say, though, the one piece of it that I think is really compelling is he argues that you need density and movement. You have to have a lot of animals, and you have to have them moving a lot regularly. So I'm being signaled, I think, that I need to stop. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I'm going to be um, sitting outside of the room, I think, with some books, I think. So if anyone wants to buy my Defending Beef book, it will be available for purchase, and I'll be able to sign it for you as well. And I just, again, really appreciate the opportunity, and thank you so much.